is your news bulletin from Power 12 Digital. It is Tuesday, 9th April 2024. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. This is news to 6 a.m. on News Power Digital. We warn listeners this news story is extremely gruesome and may trigger some persons. A four year old was killed and her body mutilated in the Ruka on Monday night. The deceased had been identified as little Amara Lalit. At around 10 10 p.m. on Monday, a woman of Fifth Street, Aruka, paid a visit to the Aruka police station to make a report of abuse. She told officers she'd been beaten by a man she knew, and the suspect had taken her child hostage. Her clothes were ripped off, and she had marks of violence about her body. A team of officers, led by Inspector Pierre and Inspector Joshua, went with the woman to the home and made a horrific discovery. Reports indicate the child was beheaded. Her head was in one room of the home, while her body was set to be in another room. The 39-year-old suspect was arrested. Two knives were recovered from the scene. Due to poor lighting conditions, crime scene experts were advised to return to the area at dawn to ensure no items had been stolen. A team of officers led by Senior Superintendent Richard Smith also responded around the scene and were on the scene up to 2.30 a.m. earlier this morning. And several police units are probing an incident where a 13-year-old girl playing with an air rifle allegedly shot her eight-year-old sister on Sunday. The younger sister was struck on the forehead with a projectile from the air rifle, police said. She's hospitalized in stable condition. The incident at the children's home in Canopia and officers of the Child Protection Unit, Chaguanas and Canopia CRDs, are investigating. A Freeport woman was killed in a crossover collision along the East Solomon Ho Choi Highway on Monday afternoon as the Mohammed 38 of Mango Street in Freeport died at the scene of the crash. The collision occurred around 3.45 p.m. on the highway, causing a huge traffic pileup. Police said a gray Hyundai accident was headed south when in the vicinity of Gasparillo flyover lost control and crossed the median. The vehicle crashed into a white Ford Ranger pickup driven by Mohammed, which was headed in the northerly direction of the highway. Mohammed was pronounced dead on the scene by the district medical officer. The driver of the Hyundai Accent and a male passenger in his vehicle were taken to the San Fernando General Hospital by the fire services ambulance and hospitalized. Corporal Ramdath and of the St. Margaret's Police Station is continuing investigations. Attorney General Reginald Amor SC says he's going ahead with the state's case against Brent Thomas, noting the recent decision by the Barbados government to accept liability in a lawsuit involving his extradition from that island in, in, to TNT in 2022 had no impact on the case against him in this country. Amor added the matter involving the state is currently before the courts of Trinidad Tobago and is sub judice. And as such, he's prohibited from making public pro 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 pronouncements on the matter. Amor said he has every confidence that the Attorney General of Barbados, Dale Marshall, SC, was acting in the best interest of Barbados, but he had no intention of offering his opinion on the matter. Retired Major General Ralph Brown was acknowledged for his leadership and guidance in the TNT Regiment during the 1990 attempted insurrection by the Jamaat al Muslimin. His contribution to national development and security were recognized by retired Colonel Lyle Alexander. It was done during a tribute to the senior military official at his funeral service at the St. Anne's, All, the All Saints Church, sorry, at Queen's Park West in Port of Spain yesterday evening. Near completion is the update coming from Minister of Public Utilities concerning the investigation into the cyber breach at state owned TSTT. The disclosure made on the Power Breakfast Show yesterday morning. Minister Marvin Gonzalez says he expects this to be done in the coming week or two. The minister revealed his position that the report be laid in Parliament and referred to a joint select committee. In news of the region, Jamaica's Health Minister, Dr. Christopher Tufton, says despite reports from the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, the Caribbean is seeing a surge in dengue cases. The country has passed the worst and moving toward the end of the outbreak declared last September. According to PAHO, as of March 26, 2024, some 3.5 million cases of dengue were recorded in the region. And finally, a solar eclipse passed over North America yesterday, Monday, putting a dramatic show that was visible to millions of people across the continent. A total solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes between the Earth and the Sun, completely blocking the Sun's face. 
those within the past have totality, including 32 million people in the U.S. saw the eclipse in its full splendor. People outside the past were still able to see a partial solar eclipse where the moon blocks only part of the sun's face. And that is news to 6 a.m. right here on News Power Digital. We love major news coming away at 7 a.m. Good morning. Up to date and credible. Power 102 Digital. It is six and a half minutes after the hour of six o'clock on this the ninth day yep nine days already gone in april Oof. it's moving quickly all right so good morning to you thank you so much for joining us on the power breakfast show um of course on the show this morning we have super super paul senator dr paul richards uh we'll have richard rago passing um I don't know if Wendell is going to join us. We got Shane. We got Ruben. My name is Steve Kahn. All right. Uh, quickly, let's get into your WTs, and then I'll see you send us hellos first thing this morning. All right. Traffic, why? I thought the road was quite busy this way. It took me almost double time. It did. Not the fact that I forgot my wallet home, and I had to rush back home and then come up to town at two minutes before six. And I was way on time, you know. I was way on time. Anyway, traffic-wise, Trin City to Yui, you got some volume. And then from uh, Val Saint to Port of Spain, volume again, all right? Take a look what's happening out in South. I got nothing to tell you about. Moving north under Solo. Uh, not too bad. Oh, no, I've got an accident to tell you about. It is northbound to the Solomon Ho Choi Highway in the vicinity of Chase Village. Ugh, horrible. And comes with that accident yesterday. Oh, sad, sad. Sorry. All right, so you got some traffic there. Uh, after Freeport, heading towards Shigagonis. That traffic is by that accident. It is northbound, followed by Chase Village. Shigagonis Main Road is beginning to build. After that, Charlieville towards the interchange. You got some volume. The southern main road from Shigagwanis, uh, the vicinity of Chin Chin Road, you've got some traffic. Kelly Village as well, all right? Out of Maraval, um, you're going to get some traffic with a little bit of volume right now. Out of Dago, I got nothing to tell you about. School has reopened. Oh, well, most schools are, some are still not um, open as yet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, all right, so that's your traffic. Let's get into your weather forecast this morning. It is 23 degrees at Piaco International Airport, 24, in a beautiful sister isle of Tobago. Mm -hmm. What the Met Office, let's see if they updated their weather. They did at 5.59. Okay, very short, two lines, generally hot Sunny and breezy at times with a lower chance of the brief isolated shower. Maximum forecast temperature for today at Piaco 34, 32 at Crown Point. All right. The weather is going to be the same tomorrow. The Eid holiday, of course, for those, um, the moon was not sighted last evening. Um, yeah, so what do you see for what you got yesterday is what you're going to get for the next three days weather-wise. All right. Um, let's see who sent us hellos first thing this morning. Let me just pull up the WhatsApp here. Whoa, that was yesterday. That was yesterday. Uh, WhatsApp, 3181021. Sunny, good morning to you. Dan Raj, out in Central, good morning. GNC Auto Security. Good morning to you. Um, all right, that's on WhatsApp. On Facebook and on YouTube, got Celia out in Valencia. Oliver Man Warren, 
Marcia Rock out in Orlando, Florida. Wendy and James out in San Juan. I Sasha out in London. Wayne B out in Covenant, Georgia. Ray Ray out in West Palm Beach, Florida. Good morning to you. Maria Celia. D. Pierre, good morning. John Cato, good morning to you as well. Uh, Boy Bedesi, good morning. Pink Panther Inc. Okie dokie. Good morning. Brenda Isaac. Uh, Fitzgerald Seals, good morning. Um, Nikisha Pierre out in Brazil Village. Good morning to you. Never been there. Carol Guevara. Yep, good morning. Love you, Husky. Trini B. Um, Trinidad Margo. I'm just reading. Trinidad Margo is in Florida. Uh, Michael Robinson out in Yokohama, Japan. Good morning to you. Um, did you go to the Formula One race? I just thought, I think it's just getting boring now. CJ New York. Um, I came home from the cold and enjoying the heat in sweet Trinidad. Oh, CJ, you're in Trinidad. Welcome. Welcome. All right. Gloria Gray. Um, Gloria Gray says, I'm feeling sad of what continues to be happening in Trinidad and Tobago. I'll get into that in a minute. More games. How did Ruka? Good morning. Brent Hatshaw. Um, and then we have Brent Sylvester, Shoin Kul, Rena Budu Jennings, DL, um, Carl M. Jack. Uh, today is the first of two day holiday for Eid celebration in Baghdad. Oh, okay. Uh, well, thank you, that Carl M. Jack. Are you in Baghdad? Chris Toussaint out in Washington, D.C. Good morning. Anyhow, Miguel. Good morning to you as well. Good morning to San Kofa on WhatsApp. All right. All right. So now that I got through my hellos and reading, and you know, I got a message. Um, just about to leave the house at 5.15 with this story that Paul read. Monsters among us. There are monsters among us. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you missed the six o'clock newscast, how to summarize that? It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. Let me see if I can find the story here, so at least I'll have it. And I'm talking about, who sent that for me again? Mm. Yeah, here it is. A young lady out in Aruka rushed to the Aruka police station and said she was beaten by someone she knew. Um, and he was holding her four-year-old daughter in the house. I don't know how to continue with this story. I really don't. It bothered me when I was driving in this morning. That's all I thought about. The police went to her home and this is the gruesome part. So if you want to change, you can do that now. If you don't want me to say it, load the volume on your radio. He beheaded the four-year-old girl, put her body in one room and her head in another room.
I don't know what to say about that. I I mean, I have nieces. One is four year old. And they're spoiled rotten. Uncle Steve is give them everything they want. They know that. How could somebody do that? I mean, I don't I, I hate to start with bad news, right? I do. I really don't know. If you want to call me up on this, call me, 222-8255, toll-free, North Americans, 866-525-1099. Yes, Hector, that is what I just said. Hector said, Steve, what did you just say? Yeah, Rina, that's another story with the air rifle the kids were playing with it i don't know if you all saw the other video um i hate to start with bad news of a gentleman lying on a bed have a little kid playing with a firearm your mother is in the room and not doing anything about it i don't know if you saw that so that's three stories right there you know, I mentioned that, and I just got so warm in this air condition. But yes, that is what I received as the news. And um, I sent it to Paul this morning. I said, I can't confirm. Uh, but apparently, he got it, and he confirmed it. And I'm seeing it online. Um, Mr. Patrick is calling. Morning, Patos. Mr. Patrick. Hey, morning, morning. How are you? Morning, morning. Well, you know, I was going good until 5.15 this morning when I got that WhatsApp. Right. You know, right. Maria right. Celia, right. that, that happened in Aruka. Right behind me, down here. Is down by you? I tell you, there are monsters yeah, among us, Mr. Patrick. We pass uh, them every day walking, driving. How you could know, you do that? All right. Let me tell you how that has happened. Oh gosh, if you could tell us. I've been saying for the longest while Trinidad have a serious mental illness situation. I totally agree with people, you. A lot of people getting involved with people and they don't know how they is. They don't know they, if they're mentally ill or what. Start up. There are a lot of mentally ill people out there. That is not a normal person to do that. No, it can't. It can't be normal. Huh? You can't be normal. No, you can't be normal to do that. You you put a head in a room and a body in the next room. Isn't yeah, but it? you know, you know, how could you do? How could you in your head pick up whatever utensil on a four-year-old? Really, I do have to tell you. Uh, I, I don't know. You, you, I, I you put him put him in, in Woodford Square, laden with honey, and leave him. I don't know. No, they they, they need to do a research on that fella and find out what are we going to be combined when they reach to that kind of state. It have all kind of schizophrenia behavior, obsession, <clears throat> paranoid disorder. It have all kind of disorder out there. And a lot of people moving around this society. Looking normal. Yeah, Looking that, normal. that's exactly what Maria Celia is saying. She says they look normal, but far from normal. Definitely not normal, normal. normal. And you, you as a young lady or a young man, might find yourself involved in a relationship with that kind of person. But you don't know until one day, any man beat you, man, beat you up, pull you close. Yeah. You run. I wonder yeah. when now to find him. Before he... And I don't have ask for mercy. It's still really young, but too nice. Look, Sunday, <laughs> a 17-year-old Venezuelan is in a bar working. Uh, someone she knew walked in, cracked a bottle on the table, stabbed her multiple times. She's in serious condition. She the report said that she passed away. She did not. That, that person who do that, that didn't happen just 
But but still, that is not the way you deal with it, Mr. Patrick. But 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 they can't deal with it. They had a, their people need to get treatment. Sometimes you have to get them to the treatment work to begin with. You're right, but how how Trinidad and Tobago does deal with mental awareness and illness? How we really deal with that? If you want to report abuse, right? like you hear the neighbor getting licked or beaten or whatever, the police will come. Well, no, the police come in now, right? The police come in now. But sometimes you really, by me, you know, hey, I don't have the answers. I don't have the answers either. I don't have the answers. But it's so upsetting. It really, it's because sad, they sent me a picture sad, of a young child, huh? They sent me a picture of they sent me a picture of the of the young girl. And uh, you know, it's they are four year old. This country just cannot settle down. If it's not one thing happening, it's another thing happening. And then another thing happening. Thanks, Mr. Frick. I just don't know. I'm really upset about this story. I am. Look, Richard. Hey, morning, Richard. Never lost anybody. Yeah, Never thanks, Mr. Pat. Uh, good morning, guys, and good morning to our listeners, wherever you are across Trinidad and Tobago. Did I send it for you guys? Did you all get it or no? Who I you talking to? You. Let me send it. Me. Please. Yeah, I'll send it on. When I when I send it, take a a minute and and just read it. It really. Oh, jeez. I didn't it's send not, it. It's not the same story you were just talking about. Yeah, let me send the copy. Morning, caller. Yeah, I don't need to read that. Good morning. Morning. Yes, good morning. Morning. Uh, this situation, like, this behavior, this behavior, this situation. I don't want to move away from the monstrosity that would have been committed there. But I know people is going to take this now and 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 make it a, a, a issue of what we are doing about 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 things like that. How do you legislate for things like this? How do you legislate people and while I see these monsters among us doing these kind of things? How do you stop them? How do you know that they will you put things in place? To avoid them from committing these kind of acts. How do you do that? I would like somebody to see because I know people are going to make this. When you going to see this is going to be a, a issue, and they're going to move away from the from the from the monstrosity of the people themselves that don't care nothing, have no mind, have no heart. You call I call those people um, social mistakes. People that behave like that is what we call social mistakes. People that occupy positions in life that should not have been there. Because they make everybody life miserable. Yeah. All right. I mean, how could well, I suppose, you... I mean, the fundamental you issue is... is your own to, child. But the fundamental issue, of course, is I think what you're asking is one do psychopaths exist and yes they do mm -hmm. and how does a society grapple with people like that it's a difficult answer thank you caller because it's something that you have to you, it's some it's something that's very difficult to pick up even though you may see signs when people when children are young and in school and what their behavior is but the ability to um intervene at those points and those young ages in terms of dysfunctionality, many times state machinery is not, I'm not saying that it's incapable. It, I th think there is some attempt to deal with it when you see dysfunctionality, but it, it just, there are just many gaps in the system. Can you make a foolproof system? I don't know. Human beings are a difficult group, a difficult group to manage. What you can do is have laws that hold people accountable for their actions. And by holding people accountable for their actions, you also mean detecting, making sure that your society, that if it is you commit a crime, you will be caught and you will face justice. 
I think that's where you have to start. Morning, Richard. Morning, everyone again. Yeah, morning, Paul. I don't know what is going on here. I guess you're talking about that gruesome situation with the foy with the child. Well, Steve was talking about it. He said I didn't I didn't know about the story. I mean, one of the stories that I saw yesterday that I thought was um and and I I think maybe it didn't happen. Maybe it, the news of it didn't happen at the time that we were on air about this Venezuelan girl that got stabbed in a in a, a bar, I think, in it's South Trinidad. That the man came in. Apparently, he's an ex. Came into the bar, broke bottles, and with the broken bottles, started to stab her up. And people tried to intervene, but of course, he was um, like, uh, I don't know, uh, I suppose in some degree of psychological rage, so people were cautious, but eventually ran up. They got the girl to the hospital. Well, she's in the hospital. She's still, um, she's in critical condition. Hopefully, she, you know, survives. Um, and they've since detained him. Um, the police have detained him. And, but it's like, what gets you to the point that you feel you could just come into a bar, break bottles, and start to stab up another human being? Well, but you were talking about the child earlier on and, and issues related to mental health. And I think we need to do a lot more related to mental health care interventions in Trinidad and Tobago and, and um, destigmatizing it. And you, you spoke about picking it up in the schools. And I keep saying there's one socializing agent in this society and most societies that is mandatory. And it is in schools. And very often you can pick up indications of potential antisocial or abnormal behavior in schools and remediate it early on. That's not to say someone can't have a mental break later on in life, you know. But if you start in schools with mental health care screenings, by the time someone gets to 20 years old, it's not a big deal to go for a mental health care checkup because you become accustomed to it in your childhood and adolescence. But we don't do that. So People, we actually make a joke out of people. Well, he mad. Well, she mad. Well, he acting crazy all the time. He actually feeling on mad all the time, you know. But what has been done about it? Yeah. You understand? And that and that is one of the big challenges we face in Trinidad and Tobago, where the reports about this 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 man who, uh, this woman clearly was known to the man, and the man was known to her. And um, so they had some interaction for a while. Um, the, she made a report about abuse, which means she was the subject of abuse beforehand. But she still had, the man still have, had access to her home and her child. You understand? So we don't take things seriously enough. We spoke about the situation regarding the, the TT Defense Force officer who clearly was showing all the signs months before and nothing happened definitively. He went and killed her and her mother. We are not taking mental health care and issues related to that seriously enough in this country. And it's not that the, the state is not providing mental health care intervention, eh? but the society doesn't necessarily veer to that as they would if they have some sort of physical pain or physical ailment. And that, that's part of the issue. And, and don't underestimate the trauma and stress of living in this kind of society, which is particularly violent, and its effect, its cumulative effect on everybody. We all seem to be coping well most of the time, you know, but not everybody is able to cope with all these stresses that are coming at them, particularly if you have a disposition or family history of mental illness. Yeah, no, you're right. It's really, really um, unfortunate. The other big story is, of course, this, which was tragic yesterday, where a car crossed the median on the highway, and a woman lost her life, you know, a Freeport woman, Azia Mohammed, 38 years old, died at the scene of the crash uh, at around the uh, Gasparillo flyover. She was the, uh, a gray Hyundai accent headed south, lost control and crossed the medium and slammed directly into her. She was driving a Ford Ranger and she died on the scene because I'm like, those, those are some of the worst accidents ever because you're not expecting a car to fly over that wide, usually wide median. And the speed it must have traveling with 
just slammed until she died at this part. I mean, when you look when you look at the road, you're seeing blood everywhere. So it looks like she may have ex um been, been thrown from the vehicle. You know, it, it's just a, a really horrible state, you know. And that, that caused a huge traffic jam. Of course, the authorities had to lock off the road to process the scene. Uh, the driver of the Hyundai, Hyundai Accent and a male passenger were taken to hospital, but she died at the scene, you know, and it was a horrific, horrific accident. Those kind yeah, of accidents so, you know, cars, where, where vehicles cross the median and, and end up in the other, um, with in the lanes of cars going in the opposite direction are always scary accidents. Yeah, there's nothing you can do about it. It's always scary. You, you're not expecting that to happen. And yeah, you're, not, you're just not. Because as a driver, on, the, on, your la, on your side, you are, you're not expecting somebody to cross into your path suddenly. You know, you're yeah. already looking at the traffic um, that's in on front your of you. side. You're paying attention to the traffic on your side. You're behind and in front of you. In your lanes, you know, but always tragic and horrific. Yeah. And and I mean you're just seeing the, 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 the carnage on the streets from the video footage we're showing now. Yeah. And there's also yeah. a part to it there where the cable barriers are in a dilapidated state. If you watch the video from the road itself, not the aerial shot. Yeah, beauty culture. Drug use has increased in several different iterations, and that also um, elicit some irrat irrational behavior. Of course, the big thing yesterday also was this solar eclipse seen across most of North America, which we're showing on the screen now, which was quite a celestial show. Which your friends were ab above us, and uh, you all were observing from Alpha Centauri, wherever you're from. Mm -hmm. we, are custom, we are custom with all sorts of things. There's some things that happen in our area that you all will not believe. Um, so this is kind of you know minor to us, but this is mundane to you. Yeah, go through humans. We get so excited. We all see this all the time based on your celestial travels. Mm -hmm. You know? So and it's that one, another, another madness of a video, Paul. Well, if it's the one with the child with the gun, I'm not showing it because the child's face is showing. Yeah. I'm not showing that. I got that several times yesterday, and Mad I'm not showing it. Oh, I saw that. Mad that was on, I saw that on... Where did I see that? On Facebook? Or did we share that in the group? Um, I'm not and sure then this, this, I, I found this particularly humorous, which I was being shared in social media, where the government spends millions to put up this walkway on Rice New Road, and you're just seeing people always walking on the street under the walkway. Look at the amount, at the amount of people. It's astounding. And then if somebody gets knocked down, the government needs to put up a walkway, and the government this, and the government that, and the government the other. But watch. Well, that's people from the water taxi. Yeah, but the people from the water taxi could still go up and progress on the, yeah, on the walkway. Yeah. That's why it was built right there, so that people coming out of cruise ships and out of the water taxi can cross safely. Oh, but it's not massive. I saw this video on, on, on social media yesterday, and but it, it didn't have any context where on the side I saw that was shared. I was saying, what, what is going on here? I'm not so sure. Well, yeah, it's showing that no matter what the government put in place, watch. Very posh, very high tech walkway, and all of them walking in the room. I mean, what are you, you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Watch, watch, watch. Morning, everybody. Morning. I mean, to see. Mm -hmm. The video that I will not show uh, shows a child. With a gun, I don't know if it's a real gun, to be honest, but it's a gun. It what looks like a real gun, because I can't, it's a video, so I don't know. And the male person in the video is telling the child, who looks no more than six or seven years, crack it, crack it, crack it. And the child is going through the motion of trying to crack the gun. I can't even do that. But the child is quite adept at trying to crack this, this weapon. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I sent it to the authorities so that they can investigate. Because the child's face is clearly shown in the video, and of course it has gone viral. And that's why I won't share it. And I won't show it because it's clearly, it is a disturbing video with a child which we should not be showing on media. I don't know what to say again. 
And another child yesterday was Sunday. A 13-year-old girl playing with an air rifle shot her mm -hmm. eight-year-old sister. Mm -hmm. oh, so that's the, the younger sister was struck in the forehead with the projectile from the air rifle. And thank God she's in stable condition at hospital. The rifle be, be belonged allegedly to, to an uncle of the children. How they get their hands on that? How they get that? I mean, people. 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 Mm -hmm. On the legal front, it seems, I haven't seen it myself, but it is being reported that the Barbados government is accepting liability for whatever role they had in the Brent Thomas abduction matter. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen it myself, but it's being reported widely that the Barbados Attorney General, Dale Marshall, Senior Counsel, or like it would be King's Counsel now, or is it Senior Counsel still? Anyway, Senior Counsel um has accepted liability and they've started negotiations in settling compensation for mr thomas for their role mm -hmm. whatever role they played in his apprehension and according to the judge in Trinidad and tobago the abduction back to trinidad and tobago our attorney general regional and more senior counsel says he will not discuss the matter because the state of Trinidad and Tobago is going ahead with its case against Mr. Thomas and mm -hmm. it's before the court. So as such, he cannot discuss the matter because yeah. it is self judice at this In point. Barbados newspaper today, under the headline of abduction deal, there is a the government admits gun dealer was wrongfully, wrongly expelled. That's in the Barbados yes. newspaper today. Yes, the headline uh, is abduction deal. Government admits gun dealer wrongly expelled. Barbados is expected to broker it by Emmanuel Joseph. Mm -hmm. the article. An out-of-court settlement for the forcible removal of Trinidadian licensed gun dealer Brent Thomas from the country by police officers a year and a half ago. The government has accepted liability. The government lawyer Roger Ford SCS confirmed. Hmm. Well, Richard, you're the attorney here. If a government has accepted liability doesn't it bolster mr thomas's case in trinidad and tobago if he's to bring the state of trinidad and tobago to court over the matter it certainly does now i'm not sure what the state's case by trinidad and tobago's government or the state is against mr thomas is if it's because it could be a different case to what barbados government has accepted liability for you understand a, a different matter but I'm but if and, and Dale Marshall has said so months ago that they and it's, it's on record that what happened in Barbados went beyond the ambits of the law. I mean you can't get a stronger statement than that. And it was how you break the law. So I'm not surprised given that statement months ago that the, the Barbados government has accepted liability. And and you know, very often, I guess they, they probably not the kind of country we have, but we go to court and spend all the millions. But they don't realize already, you know what? Let me just settle this and move on. But we will see how it goes. Never a dull moment. I mean, he's going to make some money. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure based on the settlement there and the admission of liability by the Barbados government, he's going to bring a matter. But he's indicated that I saw it in the papers a couple of weeks ago. He's going to bring a matter against the government of Trinidad and Tobago for their rule. And he says he also wants to know who authorized it from a government perspective or from the police leadership perspective, which has been this big secret in Trinidad and Tobago. You understand? It has been asked of the Commissioner of Police on several occasions, and the response has consistently been, it's under investigation. Well, the longest investigation, anyway, that's not true. There have been longer investigations in this country. Apparently, they love to cross the T's and dot their I's. Come jump out in the chat, you know you're waiting. Jump out, jump out in the chat. Jump out, you're waiting, I know you're waiting. Type. <laughs> jump out, don't wait, type. Mm. And your finger itching you, you know. Jump. Somebody needs to accept that whatever happened there. 
I'm not saying the government may not have had concerns, but clearly the way the state, aka the police, went about it, something was amiss with that. Yeah. And they drag in the government, this government into the confusion. Who now accept liability? Yeah, but it raised well because of how Barbados officials acted in in the scheme well, of things. Well, you couldn't you clear, Barbados, you, not, not get the assistance of the Barbados authorities, Richard. You can't operate independently in Barbados. No, but that's what I'm saying. The state would be liable for the actions mm -hmm. of his agents. And ultimately, that's what happened. Hmm. The state is saying, yes, we accept liability. We felt our... I mean, they're not saying it in so many words, but we accept that what we would have done um, was not in accordance with law. Hector, Minister Hines did say he got a verbal report, but he was pressed on that, and the Commissioner of Police was pressed, and she indicated that a documented report was to be submitted to the Minister of National Security. We're still waiting on it, or word of it. You see things like this, Paul, and this is where sometimes small island states, well, I shouldn't say small island states, no. This can happen anywhere okay. in the world, quite okay. frankly. All small island states. Yeah, it can happen anywhere in the world, quite frankly. The, the issue of the objectivity of reports. You do a report and you have a report done that indicates these are the facts and these are the uh, this is what was done and this was what was done wrong, X, Y, Z, end of story. But mm -hmm. a lot of the times, people's ego sometimes get involved. That's what I'm talking about the court. They have to go to court. You know, they have to go. So people's egos get involved and people go into, you know, all manner of... Um, unnecessary furthering of an issue rather than if you kept to the facts and the objective facts of of what took place and whether it was within the remit of the law or not and so it goes sometimes it goes all the way for a judge to say um a b c d e f g and therefore p or i mean it could go the other way too but it depends on what the facts, what the, what the objective facts say. And it? very often, Richard, they take the matter to court to the limit to the Privy Council and cost this country millions of dollars and still lose. That can, that can happen. Sometimes they do win, to be fair. <laughs> and sometimes they do win, yeah, I guess you're right. Is there, a to, is there a way to, to defend what is taken? I, I get it. But look how fast the Babylonian government say, you know what? Something went wrong here. Let we just settle and move on. Yeah. Maybe it but I guess the state of Canada Tobago has, I mean, at least from their side, probably figure they have a stronger case. I don't know. And very often, politics get involved. I guess Mia Motley might and her government might feel they have less to lose because they have such a commanding uh, advantage in the parliament. It's not going to affect them politically. In the short, in politics, the but you see, the, the issue of criminal liability because the, it just started off in the criminal arena, mm -hmm. right? Where they felt that um, Mr. Thomas had committed whatever offense. Issues of matters in the criminal arena like that should not get political. It shouldn't, but it very often does in Trinidad and Tobago. We have um, some say we have judges making quite politically pointed statements in this country. So, who's to say? I'll call no names. <laughs> you have papers? I absolutely do. Is Could you share them with the space, the headlines? Um, okay. okay. Well, I craft a question. Well, I'm, I'll start off with the Toronto Tobago Guardian for today. And of course, today is Tuesday, April 9th, 2024 um and the headline ag stands firm says government pursuing brent thomas case to end barbados decision not affecting tnt's position and there's a picture of the attorney general original armor senior counsel man killed in canopia home invasion and girl eight accidentally shot in head by a relative all of that is some of the sub headlines Military send-off, former Chief of Defense Staff, Richard Brigadier General Carl Alfonso left and other official military personnel and poll bearers walk alongside the casket of Major General Ralph Brown, 
during his funeral procession along Long Circular Road, St. James, yesterday. So that's the main picture. Um, on the back page of The Guardian today, three women on Wendy's board. That's the headline on the back page with regard to sport. Moving on to the news day today. Front page of the news day, I'll tell you what it is. Give parents more help is the headline. Ex-Children's Authority head wants direct state intervention. Give parents more help. And just in case you're wondering who is the ex-head of the Children's Authority, it's clinical traumatologist Hanif Benjamin. And the main picture is that of a man who takes photos of a total eclipse in Mazatlan, Mexico, on Monday, um, where, of course, you know, the eclipse was big news yesterday. So it's and like on the back page of the news, they... CPL to host Emerging Players Tournament in 2025. Search for new T20 stars. And Sammy says majority of West Indies World Cup squad settled. On to the Daily Express. The headline in the Express this morning. Farmers murder shocks village. Wife, they came for money. We don't have no money. And when he say he don't have no money, they put the gun by he head. Shot dead Kanupia farmer Akil Pasad, 58, was shot and killed in a home invasion on Sunday. His wife, Pamela Pasad, left, grieved yesterday. And of course, there are pictures um, of the relevant parties. Not a tragic, tragic instance of criminality on the front pages and how it's affecting citizens. UNC polls unlikely this year. Um, that's also on the front page. And on the back page, uh, Sammy looking to fill two spots for World Cup squad, bowler search. And CWI appoints two new independent directors. So that's it for our three dailies this morning in the lovely Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. All right, so let's get the results of our morning poll. Of course, we asked you yesterday, should the security concerns relating to the monthly $49,000 being spent for acting CEO of TSTT be revealed? In your calls yesterday, in your messages, it was a tie at 1616. Online, 80%, 80% said yes so i have two potential questions this morning <laughs> one is let <laughs> me start with the more benign one do you think the state should indicate who authorized the police operation which forcibly brought brent thomas back to trinidad and tobago in 2022 that's one okay the other one since we asked the question about god last week is do you think they are supernatural Evil forces involved in many crimes in TNT. Since we had a solar eclipse yesterday. <laughs> but we asked about God last week, so why we can't ask about supernatural evil forces this week? Which one do you gentlemen prefer? Are people saying that the thing with the child is evil and a lot of the crimes is evil? Don't you all hear that? I'm hearing you, Paul. You're laughing at me, though. <laughs> Um, and that's why I laughed before I said it because I knew it would elicit some level of humor. Oh my god. I don't Which know. one do you want, Steve? Prefer? Uh, Steve choose now. I'll go with the second one. <laughs> A little more back. Uh. What is the supernatural? Yeah. But that, that's the second one, the supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> that's the second one. There we go. You know, it's uh, like a Friday. Because it's the day before holiday. And we had a solar eclipse yesterday, which many see this is you know, evil or something. I said it was gonna be drama yesterday, you know, spiritually. Darkness in the middle of the day. Come on, darkness falls across the land. Oh jeez, I hate this. You know, I thought about the same and thing. Grizzly ghouls from every tomb are closing in to seal your doom. And though we fight to stay alive, your body starts to quiver. 
but no mere mortal can resist the evil of the thriller. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't half bad, actually. And I didn't practice. It was not bad. We could, we could get a copy of the right strike for that. <laughs> we probably will. <laughs> we could. We probably will. So All that's right. the question. Do you, think, do you think there are supernatural evil forces involved in many of the crimes in TNT? Yes or no? I should give you my scary voice to read that. Let me get my scary voice point. reading the votes. So Cheryl Henry says no. Um, well, let me see. Hold on. DL says no, no, no to no. the poll. Well, first off, Hector says yes. Lester Craigwell. Morning. Cheryl Henry says no. DL says no. Ray Ray says, ha ha. All right. 222 two, 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 five, five, Start calling now. Good morning, Zena. Is this I hear from you? Do you think? 866 yes. You can direct WhatsApp message at 866 1021 Do you think there are supernatural evil forces involved in many of the crimes in Trinidad and Tobago? Yes or no? All right, so here we go. Um, Mrs. R says no. Marval on the road says no. Carl M. Jack. Carl, you didn't tell me if you were in Baghdad. Uh, he says no. Chris. Because there are evil forces everywhere. Uh, <laughs> evil forces. I, like, I like Chris who said. Finbar Collins says no. Uh, Wayne B. says no. Lando, Lando. Hey, I haven't heard from you in a while, Lando. Uh, Lester Craigwell says no. 2228255. Toll free, North Americans, 866-525-1099. On WhatsApp at 3181021. Michael Robinson out in Japan says no. Royalty Forever says yes. Adrian Koto says no. Derek Hendrickson out in the UK says yes. Beauty culture, yes. Do you Stop think going. there are evil supernatural forces involved in many crimes in Trinidad and Tobago? Julia Esperti says yes. Good morning, Julia. If you believe in good, you have to believe in evil, you know. Let, let's you believe in God, you have to believe in the devil. Good morning. Morning, gentlemen. Sandy Grandy, no. Radio. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Oh, the devil morning. Saying, no, no. Yes or no? No. Thank you. The devil busy. Yeah, I know. Uh, Brent Hackshaw says no by YouTube. Mm -hmm. Good morning to all those watching us on YouTube. Do you think oh, there's please. supernatural evil forces involved in many of the crimes? In sweet TNT. I should have done that. Uh, two to two talk, two to two eight two five five North Americans eight six six five two five ten ninety nine. That's absolutely tool free to you, North Americans. Um, people on the web and the app and all our streaming platforms, and and on um, well, people who are watching us via cable, you would have to you'd have to go on to the internet and send us your vote. Um, mm -hmm. But people yeah. on streaming platforms, you can send it by the comment section. Um, two to two talk, two to two eight two five five. Um, and of course, you can also WhatsApp us. You can also WhatsApp us. Six twelve. Yeah. Morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Good morning, my love. Paul, <laughs> you think since yesterday are here, you know. I miss you. But listen. Well, you had to miss me, miss blame, blame Steve. Me? When when I'm calling and holding on long, long, long no, in the morning, no. and I ask Steve, he say, um, we didn't open the lines. We didn't open. I don't know why you calling if we didn't open the lines. I won't take the call. So 
so just because your line ringing doesn't mean I'm gonna take it if we didn't open. I know, but I'm saying you did you didn't open the lines at all for any calls. So Zero. Then, you know, then when you say poll yes or no, that's all you want. So Steve. At Zina age, she's once you're getting with a thing open or not here. So. Mm. Paul, behave. Paul, behave. <laughs> we have to give Wally a chance. So, what, do, what is your boat and the my love? I missed you so much. No, Good to hear you. No, no, yeah, I am. Um, my answer is no. All right. Yes, my dear. So, sometimes, you know, you have to let people miss you, you know. You know, mm. as if, if, um, absence makes the heart go further. Absence mm. me, you get horn. But what pad me? Nothing. Well, all that in it. Oh pardon me, but you hear it. <laughs> Absence makes the hard grow fonder. Absence oh, makes oh, the oh, eyes oh. go yonder. <laughs> oh Lord. Yes, yes. So sometimes if you hear me after. A deputy, central, a deputy essential, you know. All right. <laughs> well, it seems like you only don't know that sometimes. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, I have to use all what you say you have in there. I don't even have to use snake oil. I always active, you know. I always active so my bones could twist and turn all home. So, it's all right. just it is just a number. TMI. Bye. I want to say good morning to CJ. Uh, Mrs. Aris, I mean that CJ is in Trinidad. So good yeah, morning. Yes, she said so this morning. Oh, yeah. yeah so, she is. CJ, so good got, morning. Good morning. I just want to recognize Bye. some other votes that came in that I don't think you would have Bye. read. Thank you, Zena. Bye. Bye. Uh, Bye. Did you say Lando Lando? No. I did. I did do that. That's the crack one, my uncle, royalty. Adrian Kutu, yeah. Derek Hendrickson. Hendri um, did you give his vote, Derek Hendrickson? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Beauty Culture, Julia, Brent Akshaw, Wayne, Mogin, Joe we Sam no says no. Everybody has to um, Mogin, right. take it. Yeah, Trin Joe Sam says no. Trinine Boston says no. I got those ready. Yeah. Ebony Jewel, Jewel Star, no. Our crime is full fueled by greed. So I'll take down Ebony. Yeah. Um, Wayne Joseph voted already, so I saw I saw his yeah. vote already. Um, uh, call him Jack. Rena Budu Jennings says no. Against. Pink Panther Inc. says yes. Carol Guevara says no. Rena Jennings says no. Right. So I have that. I have it. I have it duly recorded. Do you think there are supernatural evil forces roaming the land and involved in many crimes in Trinidad and Tobago? <laughs> I don't understand why you can believe in God and do believe in evil. What do you think they ever see? Don't find any nails? Well, that's kind of like classic theatrical defense. The devil made me do it. Sometimes. Yeah, that's that. You go to court now and see the devil beat me do it. <laughs> but so you'll pay the price. <laughs> the devil is telling me to sell it as you say, how many sell. Yeah, only devil. Okay. Okay, well, let me help you. But, but, but the devil in jail, go and lie with him since you're taking instructions of me. Go and lie with him in jail. Uh, that's our question this morning. You know, can you continue? Carol to Gavara, the big did we, did we give Carl Guevara's vote? Yes, we did. We did. Oh, we did? Okay. Yeah. No, no. So our poll is heinous crimes these days. Oh my God. I mean, ridiculous. Horrible. That, oh, that child, that four year old child is that's just, it's just horrible. That's bizarre. That's beyond words. That is bizarre. That is out of the, you know, I'm not to trigger anybody, but they found the head in a different room to the body. Yeah. So you, you do this evil, horrible thing, and then you, oh, God, Father. Yeah. You already can't be right here in your head to do that, eh? Clearly. But, but I don't think... 
mental illness should absolve you of the punishment for that. Yeah. You know, oftentimes they have to not put them in people like that when they're arrested. Was the person arrested? Yeah. Well, because yeah. people like that, when, it, when they allegedly commit crimes like that, they can't put them in cells with regular, but other prisoners, you know. Well, really? no. They yeah. put them in a cell by themselves. They will try to isolate them because other prisoners, they, strange enough, yeah. there's a code. With, with children, they will beat them to death. Children oh, and children, with children, yeah. Children and mothers, yes. You will, you will endure the wrath of the prison code. Yeah. Abuse of children, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse of children, stuff like that. The, the prison yeah. code will take right into that. All right. So beauty culture says, so, well, okay. Uh, Richard Duku says yes. Stephen Grant says yes. All right. All right. Let's get into our seven o'clock major news. Oh, Edwin Marshall says no to the poll. Let's get into our 7 o'clock major news. AV is in. This is your news bulletin from Power 102 Digital. A four-year-old girl is killed and her body mutilated in Aruka. Police broke the shooting of an eight-year-old girl by her 13-year-old sister. A Freeport woman is killed in a crossover collision along the Sir Solomon Hochoy Highway. Creative means being used to launder money in the Caribbean, according to an economist and Colorado State University project team forecast this year's hurricane season likely to be extremely active. Details in a moment. This is news to seven o'clock on Power 102 Digital. I'm Avril Sintel Bob. Good morning. Well, before we begin the newscast this morning, we would like to warn listeners that this story is extremely gruesome and may trigger some persons. Police investigators are probing a grisly incident in which a four-year-old girl was killed and her body mutilated in Aruka on Monday night. She has been identified as Amara Lalit. According to reports, at about 10, 10 p.m. on Monday, a woman of 5th Street, Aruka, went to the Aruka police station to make a report of abuse. She told officers that she'd been beaten by a man she knew and that the suspect had taken her child hostage. Her clothes were ripped and she had marks of violence about her body, according to a report in the Express newspaper this morning. A team of officers led by Inspector Pear and Inspector Joshua went to the, with the woman to the home and made a horrific discovery. Reports indicate the child was beheaded. Her head was in one room of the home while her body was said to be in another. The 39-year-old suspect was arrested. Two knives were recovered from the scene. However, due to the lighting conditions at the premises, crime scene experts were advised to return to the area at dawn to ensure that no items had been missed. Police sources could not confirm allegations made at the scene that the suspect may have suffered from mental illness or had a mental breakdown. In some more disturbing news, several police units are probing an incident where a 13-year-old playing with an air rifle shot her 8-year-old sister on Sunday. The younger sister was struck on the forehead with a projectile from the air rifle. According to police, she was hospitalized in a stable condition. The incident at the children's home in Canopia and officers of the Child Protection Unit, Chaguanas and Canopia CIDs are investigating. Police were told that the air rifle belonged to an uncle of the children. A Freeport woman was killed in a crossover collision along the Sir Solomon Hochoy Highway on Monday afternoon. 38-year-old Aziza Mohammed of Mango Trace in Freeport died at the scene of the crash. The collision occurred at around 3.45 p.m. on the highway. Police said that a gray Hyundai accent was headed south when in the vicinity of Gasparillo, he lost control and crossed the median. The vehicle crashed into a white Ford Ranger pickup driven by Mohammed, which was headed in a northerly direction of the highway. Mohammed was pronounced dead at the scene by a district medical officer. The driver of the Honda Accent and a male passenger in his vehicle were taken to the San Fernando General Hospital by the fire services ambulance and hospitalized. Corporal Ramdath of the St. Margaret's Police Station is continuing investigations. 
Attorney General Reginald Amo says he's going ahead with the state's case against Brent Thomas, noting that the recent decision by the Barbados government to accept liability in a lawsuit involving his extradition from that island to TNT in 2022 has no impact on the case against him here. However, Amo added that the matter involving the state is currently before the courts of Trinidad and Tobago, is sub judice and as such is prohibited from public discussion or comment. Amo said that he also had every confidence that the Attorney General of Barbados, Dale Marshall, was acting in the best interest of that island, but he said he had no intention of offering his opinion on the matter. Amo was responding to reports over the weekend that Barbados government had accepted liability in the matter after Thomas sued over his forced 2022 deportation from that country. Roger Ford, the attorney for Barbados, A.G. Marshall, in the lawsuit, had advised Thomas lawyers that the Barbados government had accepted liability based on Ford's advice. Creative ways are being used to launder money, according to economist Marla Dukaran. One of the means is through the establishment of businesses. It was disclosed this approach can be used as a front at times. She cited the importance and role of institutions such as the Financial Intelligence Unit and regulations used in the banking system to be monitored for money laundering. Dukaran made the points while being interviewed on the Hard Talk program on Power 102 Digital on Monday. But some of it still makes its way in simply because you have businesses that are created for the purpose of laundering money. And so for that expression, mm -hmm. it's just a front mm -hmm. because there are businesses that are created to show that I'm a business and I'm supposed to be able to deposit X number of dollars every day from sales. But in fact, I'm really not selling that much. But some of that is, you know, there are all kinds of creative ways that um, people in this business use to launder money, but it's a money laundering is a big problem in across the Caribbean. Again, simply because of where we are geographically. She said improvements in detection and conviction can help ensure strides are made in making inroads against crime. This is why we've had reports, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, but other countries all over the Caribbean. That's why we have an FIU. That's why the banks are obligated to, once you make a deposit over a certain amount, you have to do a, a declaration saying where you got this money. You know, that's why we have so much anti-money anti laundering legislation and regulations in place so that we can pick up on when this money, this dirty money is trying to enter the formal financial system. You are listening to news on Power 102 Digital to 7 o'clock. The 2024 Atlantic hurricane season is expected to be extremely active, according to a forecast published by the Colorado State University Tropical Meteorolo Meteorology Project team. During their annual preseason predictions, forecasters said it was likely there would be a more than 50% increase in storms of all categories, most of which are expected to make landfall within the Caribbean and mainland United States. 23 named storms are forecasted, including 11 expected to become hurricanes and five that could reach major hurricane status. Speaking about the weather, let's get into the weather news for the period today till midnight. Trinidad and Tobago, generally hot, sunny and breezy at times with a low chance of brief isolated showers. Nighttime, mostly fair. Look out for a forecast maximum temperature of 34 degrees Celsius at Piaco International Airport and 32 degrees Celsius at Crown Point in Tobago. Currently, the temperature at Piaco is 24 degrees Celsius. It is 27 degrees Celsius at Crown Point. Recapping your headlines, two seven o'clock, a four-year-old girl is killed and her body mutilated in Aruka. Police probe the shooting of an eight-year-old girl by her 13-year-old sister. A free port woman is killed in a crossover collision along the Sir Solomon Ochoi Highway. Creative means being used to launder money in the Caribbean, according to one economist. And the Colorado State University project team forecasts this year's hurricane season likely to be extremely active. Well, I'm Avril Sindilbab. That was news to 7 o'clock on Power 102 Digital. Look out for more news in detail at 12 noon. And at 8 o'clock, there's an update coming your way. For more details, log on to power102fm.com. <laughs> Up to date and credible. Power 102 Digital.
All righty. Thank you so much, Avril, for our major news. You can join her again come uh, 8 o'clock for our news brief. Take a look at what's happening traffic-wise. San Fernando, uh, you got a little traffic through Link Road, Golaconda, Connector Road, Rivulet Road. The solo is pretty much uh, not too bad. Chase Village will get some volume. But after Shigornas, Shigornas, you've got traffic towards the interchange. Leaving Shigornas, approaching Chin Chin Road, and after Chin Chin Road to Ibis Gardens, You've got some traffic, Kelly Village and Helena. Um, I've seen a couple of accidents. Let me just tell you where they are. Churchill, Roosevelt, High Westbound by Aranguez. You've got an accident. Um, on the Saddle Road by Paxvale, you've also got an accident. All right. Eastern Main Road, out of Maraval, Mocha, extremely heavy. You've got traffic from the Pillars by Maracas. Uh, coming on to a roundabout by Ellerslie. Apart from that, that's, that's pretty much it. Where you think you're going to get traffic, you will get traffic. All right. Let's see if we have any more votes. Yep, we do. Um, John Cato says no to the poll. Um, Slick Money Grip says yes to the poll. Uh, Natural Mystic says yes to the poll. Um, uh, Val, morning Val via WhatsApp says yes to the poll. Captain Run, where in the world are you today, Captain Run? Uh, he says yes. And I have got somebody else here, Ronald Garcia, saying yes to the poll. All right. All right. And that's the votes that we've got. Okay. Let's get the results. Of course, our guest should join us shortly. Do you think there are supernatural evil forces involved in many of the crimes in TNT? That was our poll. Of course, our poll will stay up until Thursday morning when we give you the final results. All right? Results. Okay, he's not he's a bad breakfast. I know. Black Pearl. Morning to you, Black Pearl. Black Pearl says yes. Uh, A. Corey Jilks. Thank you so much. We just want yes or no. That's all. all right. Now, of course, our guest should be coming on shortly. Um, Rich Rich. Not there. He's not there. Well, he must be having breakfast. Mm -hmm. You are very you're overmodulating a bit there, Paul. Just back it down a bit. Your microphone. Overmodulating. Hear you. Hmm. Yeah, actually, the volume is down to almost the volume is down to almost zero. So it's not me overmodulating. If I turn on one more, that should be off. Really? So I don't know what's happening there. Yeah, probably have a good hear mixer then. Oh, sorry about that, guys. I've got a little kept back doing something. Um, right, did, so you get, did you get the votes I just mentioned or no? No, I didn't. Okay, there we go. John Cato says no. Uh, Slick Money Grip there he says yes. Mystic, uh, Natural Mystic says yes. Uh, Black Pearl says yes. Uh, Is this better, Steve? Just on me, Hold on. Val says yes. Captain Ron says yes. Um, uh, Ronald Garcia says yes. Dan Rad says yes. All right. Let me hear you pull a bit. Is this better? Yeah, just carry up a little bit now. All I right. So our poll this morning was, do you think there are supernatural evil forces involved in many of the crimes in Trinidad and Tobago? We had 40 people voting on the poll this morning. And of the 40 people, 24 of you said, no, you do not, you do not believe so. And 16 of you said yes. So 24 said no, and 16 of you said yes. So the nays have it. It's our poll this morning. During the allotted time, they do not think that there are supernatural evil forces involved in it. 
many of the crimes in Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, yeah. you can continue to vote on this poll throughout the day. We'll give you the final results on Thursday because we have a holiday tomorrow. It is Eid. Eid Mubarak to the Muslim and national community. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We should mm -hmm. say Eid Mubarak to um, um, <laughs> the uh, Muslims um, in Trinidad and Tobago and, of course, across the world because we have a global mm -hmm. audience watching this mm -hmm. show. So have a great day tomorrow. I got invited to a couple stuff tomorrow, so I may go. Mm -hmm. What is there? Has there been an update on that situation regarding the skeletal remains found in Valsi and in the back, back no. of the family? I didn't hear anything. Somebody, no. was, somebody was telling me if the DNA was of a man or something like that, and I was like, I didn't yeah. hear that. They are, they are waiting on DNA results. That's the last we heard. That's what, yeah, that was the last I heard. I wasn't sure what so they was the sent away for the DNA analysis. Is that I it? I don't know what they did with it, but um, they waited. I don't know. No idea. All right. All right. Uh, 17 minutes after the hour of um, 7 o'clock, and let's say good morning going out to Professor Roger Hussain. Good morning to you, Professor. How are you? Morning, everyone. Yes, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, of yeah. course, you're seeing um, Paul and Richard. Wendell is off today. Yeah, thanks morning, for again. Morning, morning. I, I want to start with a very interesting question based on a comment one of your colleagues in the field of economics made and I'll show it we had yesterday afternoon, uh, Marla Dukaran was talking, among other things, about the issue of money laundering in Trinidad and Tobago. And many, many years ago, I had a conversation with a sitting minister of finance, who at that time, this is about 15, 17 years ago, who indicated that at that time, he estimated the underground or dark economy accounted for as much as 35 to 40% of our economy. Has any analysis or documentation been done about the level of the integration of this dark, unaccounted for economy with the legitimate economy in Trinidad and Tobago? Um, some work has been done about 12 years ago by Dr. Sancha Sokram. She's at Celesis. She's very good. Um, Nothing has been done since then. Um, so that's the best I could answer you. That's the, that's, that's the best I could recall. Would, would you have any idea? Would you give us a summary of what she said if, if you read her paper, her documentation at that time? I, I, can't, I can't remember so clearly. What I would say is that she, was, she had worked with one of the best researchers in the world in the field. And she was able to come up with some numbers. I don't remember the exact number now. I, I am thinking 17%, but I don't want to guess um, that she came up with representing the size of the informal sector. But what I liked about the study is they use a proper methodology. They use a scientific methodology, no guessing. And when would form informal economy sometimes means it could mean um, industries or sectors not necessarily legal, but that are not accounted for in the tax regime. I'm talking about drugs, drug running, um, businesses posing as legitimate and really running guns and money and, and, and drugs, etc. Is that is it the same thing? Is it something different? No, the informal economy, as you said, has two main parts. One part could be legitimate and the other parts part illegitimate. So you could have a man selling orange and you could have a man selling cocaine. Uh, one is legal and the other is illegal. I think the fundamental concern about, of most people is what is the size of the illegal informal sector? Whereas they, and they tend to ignore the informal legal sector. Whereas I, uh, it is clear and that the in fact it's coincidental i have a book here i wrote a book on the informal commercial importers in in Chan tobago so i did some research on the informal sector and the legal informal sector you know they have a lot of problems as well paul they operate sometimes without a bathroom 
they operate without electricity, they operate without running water. So when you see our unemployment rate in Trinidad and Tobago is 4%, if you watch the, the recent quarterly report from CSO that gave fourth quarter 2023 data, you have to manually do the calculation yourself, um, and you calculate 2023 um, data, you would see that it's about 4%. You know, you, 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 you get the urge to shake everybody's hand along you and give everybody a hug and, 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 and be in celebratory mode. But that 4% has to come as well with a pinch of salt because that 4% might just well be associated with a rise in the informal sector. Uh, meaning that a lot of people left the labor market. They are not being counted in the formal labor sector. They may be working, selling a little water by traffic lights, cleaning windscreen, selling doubles, shining a shoe, peeling an orange. But the quality of the work is so poor that the standard of, the li of, of living of these people are in turn affected. And I hope that comment makes sense. Well, it's informal, but it's not, I think, what is described as productive employment in the, in the field. No, it's productive. It's, it, they are generating something, they are doing something, but it's not measured when we when we count GDP at the end of the year. It's not part of the formal sector. So you when you ask company X uh, how much people is working, uh, these people don't get picked up. These people are selling somewhere underneath a flyover or or somewhere on High Street or Charlotte Street and they are not picked up to the best of my understanding. All right. Well, how would you assess, because the, the Minister of Finance uh, quoted a couple publications and 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 rating uh, agencies recently indicating that our economy in Trinidad and Tobago is headed in the right direction. What's your assessment of the direction we've been heading for the last, well, 2023 into Q1 2024? Well, there is no denying if you are looking at raw numbers that economic growth has returned to the Trinidad and Tobago economy. No. Uh, the growth numbers for in the recently published press release from the IMF um, showed that the Trinidad and Tobago economy, you know, we, we are back on a pathway where the economic growth for 20, I'm trying to put it up as we speak, for 2024, I think it was 2.1%, 2.1%. No, so that's good. We, we should be very glad for for 2023, having a growth rate of 2.1%. In 2022, it was 1.5%. Because for a long period of time, before that, it was it was negative. And um, the point the point about it is that if you if you have negative growth and then you move into positive growth, we welcome that. But when you look, Paul, and when you look at the IMF report 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2024, and I'm sure someone specifically like you, when you, 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 you take part in various debates, you have to look at the IMF data. You would see, Paul, that in and, and each one of the reports, 2021 would have gone until 2027, I believe, 2026. 2022 would have forecasted until 2027, and 2023 until 2028, and 2024 will go until 2029 when the report comes out next week, um, the 16th. Whenever is the 16th next week, the 16th will be next week, Tuesday. That's a big day. Keep that day in mind. That's a big day when IMF is going to put out their new database. Now, from the 2021, 22, 23, 24 reports, Paul, all go until at least 2024. 2021 goes until 2026, which covers 2024. 2022 goes until 2027, which covers 2024. 2023 goes until 2028, which covers 2024. With, when you look at the 2021, 22, 23, and 24 numbers from those various reports I, I called out, you are seeing each year the IMF is lowering the growth forecast into the future. And that is what has me 
more than anything else concerned. So we have economic growth return. I'm not going to dispute it at all. We take that, we plan, we build, we see how we could crowd in investor confidence. But I'm saying to you, every time you come to decrease the bat, I'm almost seeing less runs being scored. Obviously, that should have me concerned. I would pull you aside and say, Paul, you well, are. For, what do you mean by what do you mean for, for, for those who are not eco trained in economics? What do you mean by the, the 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 growth forecast is being lowered, although there is growth over the period in discussion? Okay, no problem. Let us let me see if I could use a simple example. Um you 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 go to bat no, and I say I I I check your blood pressure before you go to bat, I, I check your insulin level, I check your pulse, and I say, okay, good. Today you are you are fit and strong, you would make 55 runs. The next day, I um I check those things and I say, Well, you're not you're not going sober today. Today you're gonna make 53. And and the next day, when I check it, I say, well, you would make 50. Each time you are you are having positive numbers, but the numbers are falling. Similarly, the growth numbers for Trinidad and Tobago are all positive for those various years, 22, 23, 24. But what I have observed is that each new report uh, offers a lower number. Still positive, so there is economic growth, but a lower number. Is that clever? How would you respond to someone who says one would expect the growth forecast coming out of the pandemic to be higher because systems were reopened and you are comparing a period of little or no activity or significantly reduced activity between 2020 and 2022 because of the restrictions imposed by the pandemic. And after that, one would expect a speeding up, but then when things get back to normal, it, it may not be as steep in terms of the growth forecast. Well, we, we, we didn't get either <laughs> in that. If you look at 2021 data, which I'm sure someone like you would have looked at, we have one of the lowest growth performances in the world. So after 2020, when all or most nations in the world, except you can't include Guyana, most nations in the world contracted, in 2021, we had one of the lowest growth forecasts in the world. And in 2022, I have the numbers right here. Let me, I don't like to guess. Um, in 20. 20 we contracted minus 9.1 percent i'm not i'm ignoring that because most countries in the world are contracted what took me by surprise in 2021 though we were minus one percent according to imf data and many other countries in the world moved into growth and not just growth as you are saying they moved into big growth so the bahamas for example may have contracted 20 percent i've just i'm just calling a number in 2020 but by 2021 they would have probably grew 22 percent we contracted in 2020 and then in 2021 and 2022 when i went i thought we'd have gotten the ripple so we didn't get it in 2021 we'd have gotten the ripple in 2022 it was just 1.5 percent so i i keep saying this something is wrong with the production function generating good and i have a reasonable idea what is wrong Something is wrong and we need to modify it. And even our good performances moving forward are not expected to be above 3% from what I remember, you know. They are generally above about 2.5, 2.12 in that area. We are not going to see 3% from now until 2020. How are we performing in comparison to other Caribbean or Caribbean countries? Except Guyana, of course. Of course. Um, if you look at our good performance from 2016, to 2023, I think the numbers would show overall globally we will rank the seventh worst performing economy in the world. If you look at it in comparison, I think Suriname and Guyana are in the top, not Guyana, Suriname and Haiti are in the top 15 as well. So we have had a bad run, and that's why this current period, Paul, 2022, when growth returned, 2023 when we have good and 2024 when we see forecasted good expected to be positive is so critical to the economic psyche of Trinidad and Tobago we have to build on it that we we must capitalize on this whatever little momentum we have now um it's an ideal moment 
to hit hard is an ideal moment. In other words, the wicket is playing good. It's an ideal moment. But, but then with that said, what are the factors that are contributing to the growth that you're identifying, even though you think it's not enough growth? Well, one, what are the factors? One is reopening back the economy, as you yourself mentioned. We are getting a kind of delayed response in terms of the economic growth, in terms of reopening back the economy. Two, we are experiencing an increase in non-tradable sector growth. If you look at the data, the GDP data that is available from the review of the economy, you would see that the non-tradable sector has also improved. Three, you would also see that the non-energy export sector, and this to me is the strongest, um, most, most powerful comment I could make coming out of the review of the economy 2023, it's that the manufacturing sector is showing some dynamism. The manufacturing sector is showing some growth. I also looked at manufacturing sector export activity just last night. And um, the, it's also showing that real, that, that, sorry, that the output of the manufacturing sector is on the rise. So for example, in 2016, we exported $948 million or thereabouts in, in non-energy export merchandise ex, um, goods. And by 2022, it was 1 billion, uh, close to 2 billion uh, US dollars in, in, in exports from the non-energy sector. That's excellent news. I could also tell you where the growth take took place. I, I, I looked at where the growth took place for some work I am doing on a paper, agricultural machinery and, 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 and implements the growth in that in export of that sector between 2016 and 2022 was 62,000%. I mean, it's probably two small numbers, but it was big growth in that sector. You are seeing growth in electrical app apparatus, dyeing and tanning extracts, um, domestic electrical equipment, tool, lace, embroidery ribbons. So we have some export sector that are showing good growth since 2016. And you remember, Paul and team, Every single thing in Chan Tobago has to be good morning. How are you? What are we doing to earn more non energy export revenue? So that's a good trend since 2016. There, I think the TTME has played a tremendous role in that, and they now have to double up their effort. The TTME needs to do a deep dive exercise at this probably the eight digit level to see what commodities has export potential to other Caribbean countries and other countries in the world that we currently have productive capacity in and provide that information to our existing block of entrepreneurs and manufacturers so that they know where the low-hanging fruits are in terms of increasing export revenue from an export potential perspective. Professor, you know, you, you had mentioned a little bit earlier before you went into the whole um, the excellent news part of the economy. You said that, and that you could see that there was some, that something is wrong, and you have a good idea of what it is. Will you, will you be willing to share what it is that you see that's fundamentally wrong? No, when, when, thanks. When I look at the data, I, every year when the review of the economy comes out, I uh, plot the data into a production function. I, I derive the data into tradable and non-tradables, and I look at tradable sector production and non-tradable sector production. And then I divide the data into energy exports. One of the things I'm noticing is that there is an increase in non-energy, non-tradable sector goods. Non-energy, non-tradable sector goods. And that's something we have to be careful about. Now, when you are swimming in the sea, or, or drowning in the sea, and you 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 see a straw, or you see a, 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 a not in this case not a straw, a piece of wood. You will grab it and try to stay afloat. The return to economic growth must be welcomed. I am saying that what we want is the economic growth to come mainly and mostly from non-energy export activity. But what I'm seeing is that too much of the economic growth is coming from non-tradable sector activity. And non-tradable sector activity, the reason I'm emphasizing that is it tends to have a high input of foreign exchange into that type of activity so that 
the net result of our economic growth, if it continues on this pathway, is the liter depletion in the stock of reserves, which is not good. Already our stock of reserves are down to, if I remember the IMF data, about 5.8 billion, and our external debt is probably up to about 5.4 billion. So we are, in a, we, we, we are getting there to the position where, not that we don't have any foreign exchange, but that they are becoming closer and closer, the external debt and the available foreign exchange. So that I try to speak out and encourage, and I think the Ministry of Trade has responded well, as best as they can. I try to explain that the need is to push more non-energy export sector growth so that it helps to augment, beef up and supplement the existing stock of foreign exchange or at worst, reduce the pace at which it declines. Is it that you're thinking that a lot of this growth has to be spurred from the private sector and entrepreneurship among citizens um, in terms of investing in whatever you can do to make foreign exchange, basically, which is what which was I'm getting from you. And how sustainable, how much can we grow? Because we are still limited in terms of the amount of humans that live here. We're only 1.4 million at best. Um, at best, let's say 1.5. Um, how much can we sustain that? And, and what is your prognosis for us really revitalizing and and growing that non-energy sector um dramatically because you want dramatic growth because you need you need your growth percentiles to be higher for a country to be able to really invest and move forward um so what is your prognosis can we do it of course we can do it we we can do it but it takes drive and determination so what are the factors that are influencing our external competitiveness? One, we have an appreciated real effective exchange rate. And that's largely because in the past, we had very heavy domestic inflation in relation to our trade partners. One of the things that this government tried to do is to control the inflation rate to a large extent. And to, between 2016, 17, 18, and 19, we did an excellent job, you know. Between 2016, 17, 18, and 19, I am, I am of the view I have to formally check that our inflation rate may have been one of the best in the, in the world, certainly in the top 20 best performances. Now, but in the last um, few years, um, in the last few years, in the last two years in particular, um, it has increased. And if you look at the data, I think it was 4.8 and, and 4.2 in, in 2020 and 2023 and um, the 2024 data is still still um is, is is still forthcoming but you would see that the inflation rate uh was an issue now then you have this whole i uh, whole whole issue of the e-tech parks so we brought two e-tech parks on stream and i think those e-tech parks are a powerful vehicle a powerful vehicle for transformation but the one in Maruga seemed to have done terrible. I mean, you don't hear anything about that E-Tech Park in, 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 in Maruga. You hear a lot of about it before elections and a sort of hype and whatnot. And then at the end of the day, when you search it or you ask people from Maruga how it is going, they say it is empty. And then there is this one that we opened to in, 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 in Phoenix Park that I know there is a Chinese luggage put exporter there, which is excellent. But there are supposed to be 10... 10 10 Chinese tenants and we only have one and and that's that's a little while now and we, what we need to do is to fill these parks fill these parks with people from abroad who export who generate export revenue some proportion of which would remain in the China and Tobago economy and they would also generate jobs if we could pull that off and fill this that move that park that seems to have some kind of problem and also fill the the, the Phoenix Park, E-Tech Park, that would be a tremendous effort. My opinion, based upon your question, is we need to open three more to five more parks of that nature. But the E-Tech Park formula doesn't seem to be working. I'm, I'm just going by these two examples. Paul may know better, you all may know better, and I'm open to guidance. Because it's it's in these two parks, you have one tenant, and I'm going to assume it's 10 by 10, which is 20. You have one out of 20, which to me 
it is not good. So I think the solution might be to par partner with the private sector and let the private sector look for local investors with the capacity of producing here to export. But, but isn't that the present model? I, I, I think that the, the, my understanding of those, those parks is that it's a public-private sector partnership initiative or the public-private sector partnership initiatives um, set up by the government, facilitated by the government, but it is the, the, the private sector that is also participating and driving it. Well, I am. I maybe you are correct. I am saying. Well, then we probably need more of that. You, you are probably correct. I am saying that the state should create just the facilities and an umbrella institution and allow the private sector, which tends to be uh, more aggressive, to go out there and look and see if they can talk to Robert, Robert Bermudez and Ansa Makal and all these various kind of people. See if you could get one park, for example, run by local investors exporting see if they could know i saw ansa makal for example briefly i saw it yesterday are uh, possibly partnering with an indian company for something with alcohol or beverages that's excellent if we could get the pr local private sector to partner with indian companies and and, and and chinese companies and and british companies and u.s companies and full two more parks to generate foreign exchange that's what we need but the end of the day the long and short is we need to fill these parks we need about three more parks and we need these parks active and kicking to generate foreign exchange given one the expected forecast for gas and two the the expected forecast for the stock of reserves Prof, how do you Prof, the issue just on paul the issue because you're talking about parks and i'm wondering if you have any idea of what is going on in the wallerfield e-tech park which was supposed to be a kind of um, IT hub. At, I know at one point they wanted it to be a huge IT park and, and stuff, that E-Tech Park in Wallerfield. Um, what, what's the status of that? Do you have any sense of what's going on there? No, no, I, I, I don't, sorry. Yeah. Because that's one of those parks, or was supposed to be one of those parks in, in a particular direction. But it just seems, you know, you just don't know what's going on. Yeah, Paul, you were going to say something? I was going to ask, he, he quite uh, extensively assessed the export environment and, and, and the manufacturing sector. What's your assessment of the domestic economy and how you think uh, things are going internally, domestically, in Trinidad and Tobago? We're getting so many, you're getting so many reports about retail outlets not getting a lot of business. You look at the, the food and beverage sector, which may be increasing in some areas. There are so many new food outlets places that are competing with the franchises uh there's a, a domestic uh production people are making local ice creams uh people are making local juices and selling uh local craft how do you assess the, the domestic economy presently um well you remember we you see there is something called a 20 percent decline in real gdp activity we since 2016 up until about 2020 2022 um we would have had a decline of about 20 percent in real gdp the economy as you we all know it's now slowly improving but that 20 percent is not imaginary and let's assume that cuts across the board that's for simplicity it means that if you were selling 100 doubles you are now selling 80. if at 100 doubles you were breaking even and able only just able to pay your workers and only just able to pay your rent with 80 doubles you will be struggling and you can't raise price to seven dollars because per capita gdp has fallen and the economy is in, in you know has a lower level of demand so it's a challenge all along for for small businesses and even more if you're a small business that depends on foreign exchange to keep your business viable and to set up product in the domestic economy. Now you, apart from a fall in sales, you also have a struggle to get foreign exchange. So it's a difficult situation all around. And that's why it's extremely critical, this $10 billion that the minister has bought, as a, 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 he went to parliament recently for, so that he could use the widen supply side capacity. He could use for productive development purposes 
and people, we have to ensure that that money does not go in transfers and subsidies. That money must be used to generate more economic activity, stimulate more economic activity, uh, hopefully more in the export revenue generating sense, so that you kill two birds with one stone. You boost domestic economic activity, and you boost it in areas that help to generate more foreign exchange, so that those economic, those small firms that need more foreign exchange would now have instead of 100, probably 250 available to them or some number like that, where they can do a little more business and, and the cycle of economic activity, hopefully one reinforces the other via the multiplier and stimulates the economy upwards. That's what we have to, to push for. And the good thing, it's an election year. So we have to keep raising these type of dialogue as to we want non-energy export sector growth so that we create employment, we create economic activity, and we generate foreign exchange at the same point in time because it's one of the few times that anybody would really listen to, to people like you all and people like us because this is, the, this is a particular time when we should speak out and impress both the leading political parties and all the political parties for that matter that this is what we want from people running the country. We want economic growth. We want to generate an employment and we want to generate in foreign exchange. And what's your assessment of the energy sector? There have been so much conversation about um, Atlantic and the challenges there. The, the still very diminished gas production in Trinidad to make we're, we're primarily a gas economy. And so much, a lot of emphasis being placed on the realization of that dragon deal with Venezuela. How do you assess? And, and, and of course, the, the intense. Uh, movement that we're seeing in Guyana and a lot of attention being placed by the uh, international investors in Guyana, though they still have a very significant presence in Trinidad and Tobago. Guyana is the seems the epicenter of the of the, the oil and gas uh, thrust in the region. I don't think we should. Uh, I think it's two completely different economy in two completely different phases of the petroleum life cycle. Steve, I sent a graph to you. If you could share it with you and the two other participants so you all can see it. I'm going to look at the graph as I'm speaking. Can you confirm you got it on WhatsApp? Okay, meantime, I will, I will speak to it anyway. This is a graph that NGC produced at the Energy Chamber Conference earlier this year. And you could see that period there, 2024, 2025, 2026, and 2027. Gas production is going to fall a further 25% or thereabouts. I always send these type of graphs to Paul. I, I, I hope he looks at him. Um, it shows, Sometimes. You see that contraction, Paul? That contraction will require the sharpest minds and the sharpest effort from our political leaders and our, our, our leaders at the head of Ministry of Planning and Ministry of Trade and Ministry of Finance. This is a time for, 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 for these people to consolidate and call in the technocrats and chat with us and let us brainstorm. You know, there's a tendency as time to once, once a technocrat puts out a number and explains something that's negative for, for some of the ministers to become abusive and whatnot. This is not the time for that. This is the time for us to sit down and have dialogue and see if there is any idea coming from any quarter that could spark non-energy non export sector growth. But that 2024 to 27 contraction in gas, and I worked it out, it's about 22% further contraction from 2023, is a sharp contraction. And if in 2023, Paul, by your own admission, a little earlier you are saying a lot of firms are seeing problems with foreign exchange, they are complaining about the fall in sales and whatnot and whatnot. Can you imagine what it would be, by, be like based on that graph by 2027? So to me, I always say that I am a simple economist. To me, as a simple economist, that requires all hands on board pulling in the same direction. This is not a time. In fact, I wish it, there was a way that the UNC and PNM could work together and form one government and work together and push in one direction. I, I, I know it might sound crazy, but this is a time when we need unity. This is a time when we don't need small talk and abusive talk from ministers and, 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 and nonsense. We need coherence conversation with the technocrats, conversation with the, with, with the public officials, and a block of ideas that could stimulate economic activity that generates economic growth, but 
export revenues at the same point in time. I really hope I have impressed that point on you so far, the importance for export revenues while you are generating growth, uh, because that's the way I see the Trinidad and Tobago economy. You know, I, you know, because I'm involved, of course, in the entertainment industry, um, even though Paul says it's not an industry, it's a sector. Um, but but, um, not, I don't think it's a, it's a... Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm wondering whether you... How, how you see, because that, of course, is very human, um, creative, intensive, um, and you have limitless potential in terms of of what we can do in the entertainment industry. And of course, we are very well known in terms of the music um, part of it. But I know I noted that Barbados, for example, and I mean, I've just recently started getting involved in television and stuff and film. And I recently saw that Barbados is pouring resources into building a top of the line studio facility to start doing filming <laughs> stuff. And they also have an international conference about with, um, with film executives and stuff from around the world taking place in Barbados shortly um, in terms of furthering that sector for Barbados. And I'm wondering, even though I think Film TT is doing a lot of good work, I'm wondering where you see the creative industries and their contribution to um, monetizing that export drive that you're talking about and earning money from an export potential. I think, I think you have locked on to something very, very important there. I think Carnival is an extremely important place where we could generate more foreign exchange. I think if we, and we have been saying that forever, I think we need to, to, to milk Carnival as much as we could, get the diaspora and other visitors to come here, have products available to sell them, and have a plan. Have a plan, for example, you know, if it is for simplicity, you were to give Carnival, let's say you, you found a way and you gave Carnival to, to Ansa Makal. Ansa Makal, within a five-year period, would probably try to generate four or five times the amount of export revenues it currently does. Why can't we brainstorm with what are those ways that an Ansa Makal or a Sabga or any big businessman would, 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 would use to generate five times more foreign exchange and we do it ourselves uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. In other words, maybe the solution is not the NCC, maybe the solution is a private sector involved arm of the NCC, perhaps a, 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 a relevant group, perhaps by a public-private partnership agreement, where some proportion of the profit goes to that private sector entity and brainstorm this, this, with this thing forward. But what I would say is that when you see 576 murders in a year, 2023, I think it was 601 murders in 2022, some of that would act as an obstacle, a barrier to some, some folks thinking, willing, trying to come to China and Tobago for a holiday. And therefore, we have to keep that in mind that in order to improve our creative sector exports, we have a number of things that we have to do in the background to fix that is within our control to some extent to fix. And directly related to what you said is the tourism sector. I think the tourism sector is a low hanging fruit, but you can't have, for example, when a cruise ship pulls up in Tobago, taxi drivers decide they are not going to, to carry the tourist along or that somebody comes along and rob and or stabs a tourist and, and that makes international media. We need a proper marketing campaign, a proper a campaign around building this tourism sector because it's a low-hanging fruit. So that, those are two low-hanging fruits you just identified there. And I think there, there are a tremendous amount of possibilities emanating from those two and they are related that we could capitalize on not in the next 10 years, you know, I'm talking about in the next six months to 12 months maximum. What, what do you think stops us from, because you, you, you talk a lot about um, unity, you talk about dynamism, you talk about energy, the energy to, to, to transform. What do you think are the, the gaps in us being able to move forward aggressively and and, and um, in terms of that energy to transform the Trinidad Tobago economy as quickly as possible. What, what do you think is the kickback? 
the key back may be linked to something that Jill Bowden said in 1564. He said, men of a fat and fertile soil are most often effeminate and coward, whereas contrary wise men of a barren soil are by nature vigilant and industrious. It may be very difficult right now to save all the energy revenues, but to answer your question, if we had started to save all that energy revenue since 2000, then <coughs> we would have had a lot of more money in the HSF and people would not have become so dependent on transfers and subsidies and our productive capacity would not have been affected. <coughs> Yeah, that's a terrible uh, food here. Yeah, well, Professor Hussain, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate the conversation. No problem. Yeah. Anytime. Uh, you are going to get call. I'm, I'm alerting you. Uh, most people do not take note of that. I'm telling you, April the 16th, the IMF database is going to change. So we would have an idea of the new forecast numbers. Please, folks, look at the inflation, the GDP, and the current account balance data um, from that putting it in my calendar as we speak yeah it's, it's critical all right you all take care and have a good morning and thank you for the invitation thank you okay so that was professor roger hussein um you know mm -hmm. economist giving um calls himself a simple economist um, giving a, a, some insight on how he sees the trend to be economy. It's always a relevant conversation. You know, you know, we, we, always, we always need to be discussing what's going on in the economy. And above yeah. all, we also need to be discussing what's going on in theater, which is Love is a Walk, which is on this Saturday and Sunday um, at Queen's Hall. And of course, tickets are available at Queen's Hall box office from 12 noon to 6 p.m. daily. I know our tickets have been selling already. So you need to get your tickets as early as possible. And of course, you can get tickets at all our various outlets. You can check RSRR Productions Theater page on social media. And you can see all of the outlets where tickets are available, including K-Squared Fashions in East Gates in Trinity and West Mall. So that covers um, K-Squared. And of course, in the Chagonas area, Creme Fresh at Brentwood Mall in Chagonas, Alextronics in Arima, Jabili Rawe in Tunapuna, and Antoni's Florals in Val Park Shopping Plaza where you can get tickets for the play as well as Sharpley Auto Services. Um, so you can get tickets to Love is a Walk, which is on this weekend. You should not miss it. It's a great distresser. You know, another area of concern I have with the economy is the issue of, are we really serious about agriculture and Trinidad and Tobago? I have a real concern as to whether we're really serious about agriculture because the expenditure in agriculture basically just covers, and the government has said it themselves, um, admin cost salaries, you know, um, and um, disbursements. And if we're really serious about maximizing agriculture in its modern iteration, there's, there are a couple of people doing some small things, but I mean, and I, and I know there's been a comment here you know, before that, well, we don't have the land space and it's better to, to work with Guyana about in agriculture, but there's so much that we can do in terms of the way agriculture has evolved. But I'm not sure that we're really serious about agriculture. I think we're more serious about keeping that food import bill where it is. Mm -hmm. So some specific sectors benefit. You understand? Because well, the the issue can be dollars, some sectors are, are benefiting from keeping it that, keeping it that way. And I suppose part of it is how do you monetize if you're if you're going on Professor Hussain's approach, how do you monetize and get export money revenue from the agriculture sector? Before that, you need to be able to provide for local consumption before you even think about export. But if you, you do have export, export going on in the agriculture sector can now. Grow here. If we are importing things that we can grow here, how can we ever think about export and competitiveness ex ex in export markets? But there are some things that I think we are competitive in. For example, we like can be competitive in hot peppers, but, but how much do we import that we can uh -huh. actually grow here? That is that is squeezing local farmers because outside it's subsidized so heavily, we can import it and basically squash the local pr producers. And those are the things we have to really address. We import so, so much that we can grow here. Each sector, each sector really needs its own dynamic advocate 
about how you move it forward and what the plan is agriculture being one and and of course there has to be some level of state support in terms of the agriculture sector but you have to have a plan about where you're going with the agriculture sector in together with the private sector because a lot of the agriculture sector is private it's not state um the vast majority of it is private i don't even know if the state is involved at any level i remember there were some of these mega farms that they they had touted from time to time i don't know if those mega farms still exist i have no clue um but but I'll, it's by and large private sector driven and there is a lot of entrepreneurship in that agriculture sector um but then you have because for example and you have a lot of um um people moving to organic stuff and you are starting to get a lot more organic stuff or grass fed stuff and things like that in Trinidad Tobago now in terms of eggs and stuff a little bit more pricey like organic stuff is but that's also a market um and and also an export market quite frankly because a lot of the world is moving in that direction too in terms of diet so I have a simple question do you, do you see us really see us about agriculture in Trinidad Tobago very simple question uh, I think we can be more serious. I and when you question anything, of course, the, 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 the chat people just jump up because happens, you, can't, you can't offer critique. You can't, you can't question whether we're doing good enough because, of course, everybody has to jump out and defend it. You all have a great you know, ABC. I'm, yeah, I think, I think the agriculture sector is, is driven by people who have a passion for it and they are doing a lot of work in it. But you, uh, now you're talking about the farmers, you know, the farmers, the, those that are involved are extremely committed because that's the life they have a passion. I'm talking about the state support on a consistent, yeah, yeah. serious level. And I don't see it. Yeah. It's so grateful in this country. Oh. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. I think we have so many potential in so many sectors that we could surpass Ghana's growth rate. You know how long we, you know long we see and we have potential? But, you know? Yeah, but and it's just a matter of hooking into it, I guess. But anyway, okay. our time is up. So Trinidad Tobago, you have a fantastic day. And of course, our listeners where, and viewers, wherever you are on the planet, have a fantastic day, whatever you do. Of course, Eid Mubarak to the Muslim community around the planet. And of course, in Trinidad and Tobago, or Eid tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. So tomorrow's the Friday. So next time you'll see us is on Thursday. And so have a fantastic day, whatever you do. You know, I'm not a big fan of Sawain. Really? No, I'm not. Um, but anyway, have a fantastic day, whatever you do. And remember the theaters on this weekend. Love is a walk. Get your tickets at Queen's Hall, which is open from 12 noon to 6 p.m. daily and all the usual outlets. Check RSRR Productions theater page on social media for more information. Um, speak to you, Brandon, early on Thursday morning as we head towards the weekend. I'm so looking forward right. to this weekend. I'm being on stage. Have a fantastic one, people.